Well then, good morning everybody. Tuesday the 9th of August and the dust is settling after what was a crazy, crazy day yesterday. I mean, I think we all expected some sort of reaction to the defeat against Brighton. I don't think any of us really expected Arnautovic and Rabio and what unfolded yesterday. Uh, it caught me off guard. I think it caught you off guard. Uh, now that there's, now that I've had time to think about it, maybe we can sort of step back a little bit and try and have more of a maybe an adult discussion about it. I think I got a little bit caught up in the emotion of it yesterday because uh, it's still and it's still. I, mean, I think I still do. But hey, we'll discuss it all today in the comments. I'm going to bring you the latest on Adrian Rabio on Sergei Milinkovic Savic. Yep, we're speaking about him again. And no, this isn't 2000 and what was it? Four, three, four years in, in, in summers in a row that we've been linked with him. And then we'll speak about Arnautovic. We'll speak about De Jong, the continuing unfolding <sighs> craziness, utter craziness at Barcelona. Who's down here there in the comments? Have a look. Stephen Reacts, good morning to you. Paula, Michael, I can, oh, Michelle, sorry. Rogerio, could see you there. Gene, Klein, Mo, we've got Joda, Dogak, Lawrence, Daisy, how you doing there? Lots of new names. Kieran, I can see you on Facebook, watching from India. Anderson, good morning to you. And Olam, watching from Nigeria. Good morning to every single one of you. Yeah, as I said, I think we all would expect it to be a pretty... Horrible reaction to the game against Brighton. But I don't think any of us would have expected from that defeat, that 2-1 defeat to Brighton within the space of 24 hours, for us to have put a bid in for Marco on out of it, for us to be in talks and agreeing a fee in the region of £15 million for Adrian Rabio. You, you saw me yesterday morning. Genuinely, I was a bit speechless. I didn't know what to say. I, I didn't know how to uh, sort of broach it. But we'll try and do it this morning. We'll try and get through it all. As I say, it took us all by surprise. And the big thing that's still, the, the, the question that's still going on in my head is if Marco Arnautovic and Adrian Rabio are the answers, what's the question that's being asked? Because in no way, shape or form, was Rabio and Arnautovic at the top of any list that Eric Ten Hag compiled before he got the job at the start of him getting the job, in no way, shape or form. Rabio, as we'll discuss here in the comments, I think we can, um, I think you can logically have a conversation about Rabio. There's caveats to it, and I'll run through all those caveats, and it was those caveats that sort of um, took over yesterday. But I'm out of it still for the life of me. It doesn't matter how much time goes by, that will make absolutely zero sense. In my opinion, it still makes absolutely zero sense. Roger, see they're rejoining as a member there. I see them, buddy. Um, what are you all saying down here in the comments? Uh, there was a super chat that flew in. Let me get that in first. Gary, you're saying, I'm so deflated. I wanted this to be a new start, but it feels like the same old, old ball. Now, Gary, I know you're not the only one who feels like that. And last night did the second episode of season two of the podcast. It was me, Alex, Matt and Bao. And yeah, as you can imagine, it was a bit deflated, the, the podcast. And there was something I said in that podcast, which definitely resonates. Yes, I'm resonating with myself here. It's a bit weird. Um, that game against Brighton felt like the 39th game of last season rather than the first game of this season, didn't it? That game against Brighton felt like more of the same and more of what we've seen before. And uh, I mean, I hope it's not going to be the case against Brentford. Uh, we all know that uh, Eric Ten Hag's not been given the tools that he needs just yet. But we're going to speak about it this morning. We're going to speak about Rabio coming up first. Then we're going to speak about uh, Milinkovic Savic. Then we're going to move on to Arnautovic. We're going to have a conversation about De Jong. And I'm going to try and answer as many of your questions in the comments as I possibly can. But look, everybody, if you haven't followed the podcast, if you haven't listened to the podcast, it's a bit old school. It comes out once a week, audio only. You can listen to it on Spotify. Apple, Amazon, Google, wherever you listen to your podcasts. It's not available as a video. As I say, I've tried to make it slightly old school. There's such a plethora of content available everywhere. But I wanted to try and make it slightly different. That's, that's kind of what I've done here. 
Uh, and Neil, you're saying, look, nothing's changed. The same old crap. And look, when, when, you, when nine out of the 11 players who started against Brighton started last season, it can't be too much of a surprise that no change has actually happened. Or what you're saying down there, 1,500 likes equals a membership giveaway. Woo! Always feeling chippy this morning. You've got to listen to all. Drop a like on the video. Always feeling like Santa. Maji, how you doing all? <sighs> yeah, yesterday was was crazy on this stream. It really was. Crazy is not the right, the right word to describe it on this stream. It was just, I think I was staggered. Because the, 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 the one quote that sort of goes over in your head when you think about it again and again and again is Eric Ten Hag saying that we're not going to sign any players. We're signing the right players. And that's why we, he, we have been so steadfast in Frankie de Jong. But something flipped. Something changed. And maybe it was the 2-1 defeat to Brighton. And if it wasn't a 2-1 defeat to Brighton, then it was a massive coincidence. Because after this weekend, now, as we can see, let's go into the story from Paul Hurst. Uh, this was coming last night in the Times. <clears throat> the Manchester United are closing in on a £15 million move for Adrian Rabiot. This is what he's saying. Man United closing in on the 15, pa 15 million pound rated Juventus midfielder Adrian Rabio. Still, an outline agreement has been made with the Italian club, but personal terms are yet to be agreed with the Frenchman. Fabrizio Romano's had something to say on that this morning. He said this Manchester United are in direct contact with Adrian Rabio and his mother, Veronique. Veronique? Yeah, Veronique. To negotiate on the personal terms. No issue with the Juventus as they want to sell Rabio this summer. Eric Ten Hag was also involved in the direct discussions with the French player. Now, as I said at the start of the stream, um, I can understand if you want to have a discussion and debate about, uh, about Adrian Rabiot. Somewhat of a mercurial talent. Somebody who's played for PSG, played in the French national team, played for Juventus. He can't be a shit footballer, but he's somebody who comes with baggage, two, three, four suitcases that his mum's packed full of baggage. And I think that for me was why my reaction to the Rabio story was so vociferous and angry straight away. It's like we've just got rid of Paul Pogba, in my opinion, got rid of Paul Pogba. And now we're going to bring in somebody else. And it's not, it, it might, it, 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 it doesn't make sense. In the same way that I, you know, my reaction to, my reaction to Cristiano Ronaldo leaving the Real Vallecano game. I did that video on the Sunday night because in my opinion, it didn't match up with what Eric Ten Hag had been doing. Somebody who's been so headstrong in the discipline and X, Y, Z. Why on earth would he let Ronaldo leave at halftime as it transpired? He didn't let anybody leave. So my gut was right on that. And my gut with this Rabio deal is, the idea of it, is that that's not really the sort of person and player that Eric Ten Hag, has, has, in my opinion, is trying to bring into this dressing room. Now, look, Mike, you're down there as well. As I say, the Rabio one, I, can, I think you can have a debate and a conversation about. He's 27. If, if Eric Ten Hag can coach him, then he will be an upgrade on, on Tom and Fred. And, we, and we, can, we can all safely say that. But it's the baggage that it comes with and the character that he is. It just, in my opinion, it seems to be going against the grain of the, of the people and the characters and the players that Eric Ten Hag is trying to bring into this team. That's what doesn't make any sense to me. Frankie De Jong, you can completely understand it. This one, I don't particularly, by comparison, understand it. A super chat that someone sent in earlier. I don't want to miss it. David uh, saying, give Baldy the right tools. If the Glazers are all about money, they don't realize a quality team and trophies equals more money. David, I think I'm going to do an updated video on the Glazers, the Glazers and the Glazers strategy. Uh, all the OGs on the channel will remember I did a video quite a long time ago, sort of exposing the Glazers top four strategy. How the fact that every time we finished outside of the Champions League, our investment the following summer would increase. And when we when we finish in the top four, it would decrease because their pattern of strat their, their pattern of um, spending was all around finishing in the top four. Now I want to do an updated video on that because and uh, you know, you know, it's it's gonna get on my nerves again because it always gets on my nerves as soon oh, as soon as you lose a game and it's all about the glazers, the glazers, fuck no, just fuck off is all I would say to that. 
and I don't don't want to swear there, but it just for fans of other clubs, it's it's exhausting trying to have the conversation about the Glazers. But they are the common denominator. They have the been they have been the facilitator of our downfall post Fergie. Actually, no, during, well, Fergie was just a genius who managed to navigate it all. But I will do that in a separate video, right? I want to focus on uh, Rabio, on uh, Milinkovic Savic, and then on on Outovic and De Jong. And then we can have a conversation about um, the Glazers. Nick, how are you doing here, buddy? Uh, you're saying, look, please don't tell me Rabio and Arnautovic are replacements for Sesko, Anthony and De Jong. I'm getting a really bad feeling about this, and I hope you, I hope I'm wrong. Hey, Nick, man, I, I, I hope you're wrong. I really hope you're wrong, and I hope. Look, if we, if I was to dive a little bit deeper into this story, and we get quotes from David Ornstein yesterday, then maybe it's not just a, a, a replacement. He's saying, I understand that Adrian Rabio is a leading target of Manchester United for central midfield. Pursuing him is not a knee-jerk reaction to yesterday's result. It's something that's been brewing for a while. And I suspect from the sort of noises I've got around Adrian Rabio that United might look to do the deal additionally to whatever will happen or won't happen with Frankie de Jong. Um, there's a little comment there that's just caught my eye. And I don't know how in the goddamn world you're trying to put those three names in the same sentence together. That's why it caught my eye. <laughs> Jesus. I'm not here writing Rabio off. Right? I'm saying that there are red flags. There's definite red flags with Adrian Rabio. And after years and years and years of a goddamn toxic dressing room, you know, one of the things that I don't want at my football club anymore. Players that come in with red flags waving all around them. Um, and that's just my, that's, that's a personal opinion driving that. And that's what I mean. I think we can have a fair debate and a conversation about whether Rabia will be a good deal or not. Um, I would consider him a supplementary signing for midfield, a bit like Christian Eriksen, because Rabio does not replace the idea of Frankie de Jong. This is written by James Horncastle. Uh, you'll know who James Horncastle is. Writes for The Athletic, uh, an established uh, cover, cover of Serie A football. And this is what he said about Rabia, which I thought was an interesting thing that we could lead to a bit of a conversation here this morning. Um, what about Ten Hag's brand of football? Other than the occasional carry, Rabio could not be more different from Frankie de Jong if that is one is signed as an alternative to the other. I don't know this bit. What does it tell us about Ronaldo's future too? If a player of Rabio's physical output is to be reunited with his former Juventus teammate, presumably to do some running for him. And how serious are United about quietening all the noise coming out of the club by pursuing Rabio and Marco Arnautovic, who for different reasons have made headlines off the pitch? As much as Rabio may be considered an enigma, there is arguably no greater source of perplexity in football right now than how United continue to be run. And that's certainly the truth. That's certainly the truth. And he is an enigma, right? Hell, it might work out. But it just seems a bit odd to me. It just seems a bit strange to me. That Rab and maybe these are the... the like we, we keep hearing that uh, Frankie Dion was Eric Ten Hag's A, B, C and D. There were no alternatives. And I imagine the club had kept a lot of this stuff behind closed doors, a lot of this stuff under wraps. But then for the club to pull the trigger simply in response to a 2-1 defeat to Brighton, and that's what's happened. There's There's been a clear... If if um, if Ornstein is correct here, and look, this, is, this isn't a knee-jerk reaction, and that Rabiot has been on our list for a good while, the knee-jerk reaction has been that we pulled the trigger after Sunday, right? And that's what I think doesn't sit right with a lot of fans. And timing, yeah, maybe it's just poor timing, but shit, it's the timing that they chose to do by pulling that trigger. Now, let me go down here and read a, a couple of your comments out. Fizz, I can see you there rejoining as a member. How you doing, buddy? There's a super chat up here. I don't want to miss it. Um, Phil, what are you saying? Look at Rabio's stats. They're not good in the Italian league and the English league is tougher. I know that I do use stats quite a lot and I have took I have seen those stats and I was considering bringing them up here but I've decided against it at this particular moment in time. I want to I want to let this Rabio story develop because I'm not I don't want to sit here now on United People's TV and turn everybody against a player 
in, immediately before he's kicked a ball for the club and, and lead in that sense. But I just can't help the fact that it that, that it just that this is Ravio is not part of a long. Um, it's just it, it's it still it leaves me a bit speechless. This Rabio story it really leaves me a bit speechless. It's just a it's it's odd. It's odd. Rabio's odd and on out of it. Is Jesus? That's that's that, see that just that makes no sense whatsoever. Babylon Burnley, you're saying, look, Brentford, Liverpool, how many points with McFred playing? Very worried. Give Rabio a chance. He cannot be worse than McTominay. And that's the thing. That's ultimately the big thing behind all of this, Babylon Burner. Everybody's just going to look at Rabio. You can look at anybody. And I keep using the analogy. It's like going into a shop when you're stoned. And every single piece of, like, I'll have that bagel, I'll have that sandwich, I'll have that wrap, I'll have that roast chicken, sod it, chocolate bar. All of it looks good. That's what United are like with midfielders now. Everybody. You can look at, like you have yep, you, you, Brighton, yep, okay, Cassetta, you could come in. Anana from Lille, every single midfielder looks good, which makes it difficult to identify who the right midfielder is, which is what your scouting department is supposed to do, which is what your manager is supposed to do. And again, if we're looking at how Ten Hag has operated this summer, whether we've thought it was correct or not, without a scouting department that he could trust, he's been going back towards the Eredivisie. He's been going towards Dutch players. He's been going towards former Ajax players. And now all of a sudden, Adrian Rabiot comes into the conversation. It's a, it's the only player that we've been heavily linked with to the point where we're going after him that hasn't really been part of that, maybe apart from Benjamin Sesko. That's what I mean. It just doesn't really make... A, there's a lot of reasons why, for me, this doesn't really make complete sense. But I'm not here to dismiss the concept that Rabiot could be a good signing. Because he could well be. It just, in my personal opinion, it comes with a sort of baggage that I would prefer Manchester United to avoid. Given what we've managed to get rid of over the last couple of years and what we're going towards, right? And that that there is a personal opinion. And I can understand why some of you on the video that I did yesterday were probably going, hold on, Sam. I think you're being a bit harsh here on Rabio. And yeah, I think I am being slightly harsh, but that's because that's driven from uh, recent experiences over the last few years of the wrong sorts of characters in the dressing room that have polluted the environment of Manchester United. Uh, sorry, Dad. Looks like I missed a super chat there from good old Sigmund. How you doing, Sigmund? Let me go up here and read it. Thanks for letting me know in the comments. So many comments coming in here. My word. Jeez, where is it? Where is it? There it is. I've got it, my friend. Interested in your thoughts on Fergie and Gill still offering their services. Doesn't their involvement scupper any true foundational changes they we want? I mean, it depends on their involvement. So Matt Busby was always there if Fergie wanted to go and knock on his door and he went to speak to him and nobody was really particularly offended by that when that happened. Gill's a bit of an interesting one. It's a little bit different to Fergie. I had, I had such optimism that things were really changing, that, we, that, that things were changing this summer. Uh, after all, just all, so many changes happened behind the scenes. We, I feel we got the perfect manager in. And I know for a fact that he wouldn't have taken that job without some real, real assurances. But here we are on the 9th of August after our first defeat of the season. And we're still sitting here with a net spend of around about 50 million, 50, 60 million. And of course, it's not about net spend, it's, but it's about the primary targets. We don't have that ball playing deep creative midfielder yet we don't have that new attacker in that we needed we knew we needed before the Ronaldo situation and now it's even more so <sighs> look go down here as, as I say look Jab you can go to look Jeb sorry saying the Rabio can be far more composed on the ball and press resistant most likely to be dropped for missing meetings though Rabio clearly is a talented footballer you don't play that many times for PSG, for Juventus and for France without it. But this is this is a man who who literally took himself out of the 2018 World Cup squad because he didn't want to be a backup. And he had to sit there and watch World France win the World Cup without him from the sidelines. This is a man who ah, comes with challenges, I think would be the fairest way to describe it. But Rabiot, of course, 
is not the only midfielder who we've been linked with over the last 24 hours. Because Jason Burt from The Telegraph has brought up the old name of Sergei Milinkovic Savic. Now let's read this story here and see what he's saying. He's saying Manchester United are pushing ahead with a surprise bid for Juventus's Adrian Rabio and are considering a move to finally sign Lazio's Sergei Milinkovic Savic as they attempt to rescue what has become a frustrating transfer window. A fresh offer for another Italy based player, Marco Anatovic, is also expected. The moves for Rabio and Milinkovic Savic have followed the growing realization that Frankie de Jong just does not want to join them. Which is not something that Andy Mitten says, and I will I will go down there uh, later on and read that. Dutch midfield is intent on staying at Barcelona, even though they're trying to force him out. And it, I, I, honestly, what is going on at Barca is crazy. But Milinkovic Savic, right? There's a name that maybe we didn't expect to get linked with again this summer. This is a player who we have been linked with for a long, long time. And by the way, what a tash. Look at the craft on that tash. My God, got the curly ends. Excellent tash. Top 10 out of 10 for the tash. Milinkovic Savic. What's your take on that? First things first. Milinkovic Savic is not a De Jong replacement, right? Milinkovic Savic is like a hell of an upgrade on Scott McTominay. He's a box-to-box midfielder. He is somebody who's more naturally suited being closer to the edge of the opponent's box than the edge of his own box. 27, he is a... um. Out of all these three names we're going to discuss here this morning, Arnautovic, Rabio, and Milinkovic Savic, right? Milinkovic Savic is the one that you can look at and say, that's the signing that has some ambition behind it. So that's that, that's a signing that will probably cost a, a decent amount of money, uh, but a signing that could probably improve quite a few teams inside that Premier League. And he's somebody who we've been linked with for a long, long time. Now, and I've seen it down from you in the comments about five times so far this morning about Vanya Milinkovic Savic. Now, if you don't know who he is, we signed him when he, I think he was like 17, 18. And that's Sergei's brother. We signed him as a goalkeeper. And it was really weird because I don't think he ever came to Manchester. I don't think he ever came to the club. And if he came to the club, he didn't play for the club. It was a really weird transfer. And he ended up going back and leaving Manchester United. And it was kind of like a sour taste. Would that stop him from... Come on, people. I don't think that would stop him. Right. Yeah. You could you could you could you could think like that if you want, but I, there's no way that's going to stop him doing a move like that because of what's happened previously. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm underestimating how badly we treated Vanya. But Milinkovic Savic at this moment in time is added into the same category as Wesley Snyder, as Nicholas Gaetan, as one of those sort of attacking midfielders who could probably come in and really improve Manchester United, but ultimately. Um, well, he might not join us. But Milinkovic Savic, in my opinion, is a separate conversation to Frankie de Jong. Entirely. Completely different conversation to Frankie de Jong. Because he's somebody who's far more naturally aggressive inside the opposition's half. Somebody who's an absolute physical specimen. Somebody who's top level. And somebody at the age of 27 could come in and be expected to make a, a massive, massive difference. Massive, massive difference. But yeah, this is Jason Burt saying this uh, from the Telegraph that Manchester United... Oh God, that's not supposed to happen. The Manchester United are finally considering a move for him. Now, I don't know whether that is... Let, let, let's see how this is... Um, going to be reported elsewhere. Anthony and Lisa, you're both down there saying how much would he cost... Uh, you're looking at around about 50 million, I believe, is the price that we're seeing quoted. You will remember that, uh, what was it, a year or two ago, it was 60, 70, 80, 90 million. It's down to around about 50 million. Let's see what goes on there. Um, but it either feels that Man United have now sort of accepted that this Frankie de Jong situation is getting further and further away from their grasp. Or we're doing all of this at the same time. 
Manor, you're saying, look, Sam, you're Serbian. People from the Balkans, we have different understanding of some situations. Yeah, maybe, it may, maybe you're all right. Maybe you're, uh, you're all correct that what happened with his brother Vanya left such a sour taste in the, in the mouth of, of the Milinkovic Savage family that he wouldn't even consider it. And he'd just give the two fingers to Man United. Well, I imagine we'd find that out extremely quickly if we went in to try and sign him. Um, let's go down here. Surely must be a Portuguese midfielder from La Primera. All technicians and comfortable on the ball. Well, what is it? Vitinha went to PSG this summer, I think, as well. But here we are on the, on the 9th of August having a conversation about Milinkovic Savic. Again, it's, n none of this really sort of sits right with me, man. In my opinion, it doesn't really sit right with me. These are the conversations that we, as fans, were having, I don't know, June? Early June time? Something like that? We were talking about options. I guarantee you we had a conversation about Sergei Milinkovic-Savic at some point as well. But, I don't know. I, I may well end up having egg on my face this summer by saying that I, I was so convinced that Man United, that we would all be happy as fans come the end of the summer. I'm definitely losing faith in that now. I have to admit that. I have to. I, you, you can't not when the last 24 hours have involved Rabio and Arnautovic. It's weird. It's weird. Well, it's not weird. It's just it's United. Uh, talking about Sesco to Leipzig, I'll, I'll speak about that. Don't worry about that, Jack. Oh, no, sorry, Chris. He's saying apparently we bid 60 mil for Milinkovic Savic. Would Milinkovic Savic, Rabio, and Rodriguez be better than Frankie de Jong and Rabio? Is that the Argentinian one, Rodriguez? At this moment in time, no one particularly knows what's going on there. Um, there we go. Right, let me bring this up. I was going to bring this up later on, actually, because I was going to be speaking about Marco Arnautovic. But seeing as so many of you in the comments are speaking about it now, I'll bring it up right here, right now. Let's get this on screen. Benjamin Sesco. Benjamin Sesco. We can add him to the maybe list. Well, actually, not even maybe list anymore. Fabrizio Romano, Benjamin Sesco to Leipzig. Here we go and confirmed. Done deal as anticipated on Monday. It's also signed between the clubs. He will join them in 2023 and he will stay at Salzburg. Let's be completely honest here on two fronts. Number one, I'm absolutely, I have zero surprise in the fact that Red Bull Salzburg have sold to Red Bull Leipzig, right? I really wanted Tesco. You could sit, that's a sort of exciting young talent that, with the right coach that would be brilliant. But Salzburg wanted to keep him for another year. And that was always something they, re, they affirmed. They absolutely f made that clear that they wanted to keep him for another year, which effectively ruled United out at, at that particular moment in time. Because I don't think we were going to be prepared for that unless we had some long term strategy where we could have let him stay there for a year and sign somebody else. But we didn't. So sesco has gone to Leipzig. Not this year. He's staying at Salzburg for one more year. But you can scrap Sesco from the list as well. And Milinkovic Savic, it's not, he's not a conversation that you have around Benjamin Sesco. They're two completely different players. Benjamin Sesco here is a pure and out striker. So he can play on the wing. He's, if you want to try and go that, he's an attacker. He's a, he's a, he's a full-on attacker. Milinkovic Savic is an attacking midfielder. Different positions entirely. If we had gone more aggressive with Sesco, could we have got him? Well, that's going to be the hypothetical question that everybody asks. But in reality, it, it will come as no surprise to anybody that Red Bull Salzburg have sold to Red Bull Leipzig. And it's a smart move by Leipzig. They've now got Werner coming in this summer for a cut price deal. And they've got, of course, Christopher and Kunku leaving next summer. And that's the player that I've, well, I've wanted us to go after this summer. He's got a release clause. Christopher Nkunku will be leaving Leipzig next summer for in the region of 60 to 65 million euros. Let's see how he gets on this year. It looks like Leipzig could be having a decent year in the Bundesliga. Not only they kept Nkunku, they got Werner in and they got another couple of good signings too. But Sesco is going to be going there. Um, I wouldn't say 
I wouldn't I wouldn't use the word embarrassing when I talk about that. I I, 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 I tweeted about it. Yes, I said, look, Man United's transfer window seems to be exploding in our face yesterday. And that was the feeling that we really got. But yeah. Sesco off the cards. And at the same time as Sesco being off the cards. And I would love somebody in the comments genuinely to give me some decent reasons why I should be even slightly remotely excited about the idea of Marco Arnautovic. Genuinely, someone someone give it to me. This is Fabrizio Romano here yesterday saying this. Bologna's director, Marco Di Vaio, said, Man United and Arnautovic, we're proud of Man United's interest in Marco, but we are not planning to sell him. We want to keep him at Bologna, as the president said. He is a key part of our project. There's not even a price tag. Fabrizio also saying that Eric Ten Hag's a big fan of Marco Arnautovic and convinced he can be ready for the Premier League. That was what I was going to speak about there. Obviously, Benjamin Sesco, that's now done. But for the life of me, I can't... I can't get behind any idea of Marco Arnautovic being a good signing. I do not give a toss that he scored 14 goals for Bologna in Serie A last year. And that was two less than Gianluca Scamacca. You cannot, for any reason, tell me that I should be excited about United signing another 33-year-old striker. Another stopgap. And Emir's down here saying this. There's no way in hell that Arnautovic was anywhere near a list of attackers that Eric Ten Hag would have wanted. But now, he might he might well be, because that list might be decreasing. And I can guarantee you, absolutely guarantee you, that if Rabio wasn't going into the last year of his contract at Juventus, that we probably wouldn't be in for him either. It feels like we're going after cut price. You, you can't help but shake that feeling. Tyro Malasia was a smart signing. Identified a player who clearly, yeah, I'm looking forward to him. And geez, he should have started against Brighton and I hope he starts against Brentford. And yeah, look, you, 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 uh, Jonathan, you can mention in the comments down there. He's saying, look, he played under Eric Ten Hag at 20. Yeah, he did. He's also a fucking raging racist. And I don't want that anywhere near our club. In the same way that Adrian Rabio's got, that's Milinkovic Savage with a crack and tash. Adrian Rabio's got a lot of baggage in terms of uh, his 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 character, his personality, and obviously his his mum being his agent. There's a whole different argument and conversation here about Marko Arnautovic and the people that I don't want inside that dressing room for Eric Ten Hag. But apparently we're in for him, and I, look. I'm going, to try, I'm going to try and read this. I'm going to read this later. And I'm going to have a conversation, maybe in a separate video, about why Arnautovic might be a good signing. But I really, be honest, do not think I will be able to have that conversation. It's another... We were told that Igalo was a short-term fix. We were told that Ibrahimovic... Uh, Ibrahimovic was probably it was a cracking signing. I wouldn't put him in the same category. Falcao... Um, so many strikers that we've signed over the hill when they've come through. And I don't, I, honestly, for the life of me, you can try your hardest in the comments to tell me about the positives of signing Marko Arnautovic. But nah. I, I cannot see it. I cannot see it. Chris, you're down there saying on out of it. Is that not worth a video? Yeah, look, I'm going to wait for it to continue to develop. As I said, I think there's, I can happily, and I will do a video on Rabio. I think there's a, there's plenty of conversation you can have about him as an actual footballer, about where he would actually fit in the team and how you can, if you really want to try and sort of push it and say how he could be a good signing. I don't think I can possibly have that energy for on out of it. I cannot see it. Hell, prove me wrong. But uh, I, I just, I, I don't know. I mean, Andrea Bellotti is available in a free transfer. 
similar sort of concept, isn't it? Short-term fix. But no, uh, yeah, it's just that that's the that's the one that really caught me off guard yesterday. Really caught me off guard was that Arnautovic one. Um, it doesn't make any sense whatsoever, in in my opinion. And it's um, yeah, it's odd and it's strange. And it's just it it, it sums up a as I say a twenty four hours, which was really sort of we were all down and we were all down and hurt on the floor after the Brighton game. And then we just got elbowed off the top rope by Arnautovic and then kneed in the face by Rabio. It was just like, you what? You what? All these things happening at once. And that, that's, that's what caught everyone off guard yesterday. That's what caught everybody, but I certainly caught me by surprise. Um, Nick, you're down here in the comments. What are you saying, sir? We literally have no scouting department and the board is just clowning around. Eric has to do three jobs. Now it appears, it, what, and now it appears what he obviously can't do. Look, man, we don't have a scouting department and we have John Murto who took it upon himself to lead the transfers, which we knew was a risk, huge risk. And it was the success of him as a football director, therefore, um, depended on the success of this transfer window. And of course, a lot of that has revolved around Frankie de Jong, which I have reiterated quite a lot of times. But I, the majority of this de Jong situation is not United's fault. And I will update you on here on this because lo and behold who could who could possibly have seen this coming Barcelona have been blocked by La Liga from registering any new players they've they've spent more than any club in European football and they cannot register Rafinha they cannot register Lewandowski or Kessie or Christensen or whoever else they goddamn signed they can't play for them for their season opener this weekend because, lo and behold, again, who could possibly have predicted this? The Schneider accountants at Barcelona have been very, very Schneider. Now, you'll remember yesterday I did that video on the fact that they agreed a deal with Manchester United on the 14th of July, 85 million euros. And on the 15th of July, they told Frankie de Jong that there might be some form of criminality inside the contract that he signed with the club, the extension, which included, of course, those deferred wages, and that that might have to be annulled, and that de Jong and his representatives might get caught up into it. The threats that they are doing are just insane. It really, really is insane. And look, going down here, this is from Sid Lowe. This, oh, I could read this earlier, that was annoying. But look, Bar he's basically saying this, Barca can't register their signings. And this is this is the mad thing about it, right? Because the accusation, which I did cover in my video yesterday, the accusation is that Barcelona, their deal with Sixth Street was to sell off their TV revenues, 25% of their TV revenues. And the accusation that's being aimed towards the accountants at Barcelona is that they set up a holding company they got the money for the bid to go into that holding company, added in 150 million euros of their own money, and then presented that to La Liga saying, this is what we've been paid for it. And La Liga said, hold up. That's not what the price was. You've inflated that by adding your own money in. Therefore, we're taking that right back down. So therefore, they're 150 million euros short of where they need to be. And therefore... Barcelona are being blocked by the Liga for registering any of their new players. I, I think Frankie de Jong's got a bit of Stockholm Syndrome at this point. If you don't know what Stockholm Syndrome is, it's when somebody uh, is taken hostage and is kept in that environment for so long that they start getting feelings towards their hostage taker. They start thinking that that person actually cares about them. And it really feels like that's kind of going on with Frankie de Jong because, I mean, I know it's his dream club. But, bro, come on. Where is the, I don't know, where's the, where's the self-respect? They are trying to, they are trying to drag him out of the back of the horse cart, butt naked through the town, like getting, getting, walk, walk with a shame bell through Barcelona. Shame. That's what they're trying to do to Frankie de Jong. Somebody's got to put that on. 
the porter on the <laughs> on the woman's face and then Dion getting dragged butt naked. That's what it feels like. Yet he still doesn't really want to force the exit. And I know he can't force the exit because it will basically um, get rid of him. Um, get rid of... It, it would take power away from his negotiations for those deferred wages. So I understand the silence is a requirement. But pff, this is... What Barcelona, like, trust me, what Barcelona have done and are doing this summer will be remembered forever as a case study. It really will set precedence then and they won't happen again. They've been they've been trying to do they've been constantly trying to find loopholes. It's wow, it's it's crazy, man. It is crazy what they've done. And United have got caught up in the spider web of that. And I don't hold John Murto responsible for that. I don't think anybody could have predicted it. Even if Eric Ten Hag, and I think Eric Ten Hag did get those assurances from from De Jong, otherwise we wouldn't be this far down the line. And as look, and Andy Mitten says over here, he goes, look, Manchester United wouldn't be in this if they didn't think they had a chance. And he said he's actually more optimistic of him joining United than he was a week ago. Well, come on, come on, uh, Blake, you're over there saying, look, I'm putting all these ads in your videos is annoying. I don't put any, I don't put them anywhere. That that would be down to Facebook. It's not like that. That's I, I don't control where they go. Sorry, man. Um, Talk, people are talking about bringing back Memphis to pie. Blah, 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 blah. I mean, uh, I don't know about that. They've sold off 25% of their TV rights for the next 25 years, man. That's this, yeah, this, this window now has got me feeling like that. Just. It's crazy. It really is crazy. Um, my gut instinct is telling me that I think Adrian Rabiot, this deal will go through. And my initial reaction was pretty emotional around it because of because of what we'd let go and because of where I thought we were going towards and because of the characters I feel that we need in that dressing room and don't need in that dressing room. Uh, for me, that's why the red flags around Adrian Rabiot were a bit brighter than other red flags. Oh, Marco Arnautovic, I don't care what you say to me. I can't have a serious conversation about him coming to Manchester United being a good thing. I just can't. It's another regalo. And it's another short-term stopgap. Because we can't either A, get who we want, or, or B, I, I don't know. It, it's odd. And then C, this Milinkovic Savage rumours. Well, I've been here before. Let's find out if anything's different this time. But there's absolutely no doubt that of all of those three signings, Milinkovic Savic is the one who could come in from those three and make a massive difference to this team. Huge upgrade on Scott McTominay would bring a new, not a physicality, but an actual quality on the ball and a ball carrier too. Good. We're definitely not going to be getting Benjamin Sesco. Fabrizio Romano has confirmed that he's off to Leipzig. We can scrap that name from the list and maybe we can scrap De Jong from the list. But to go from the idea of signing Sesco and De Jong to all of a sudden signing on out of it and Rabio. That's a hell of a drop. Now, it's like getting out your Ferrari and jumping in a Fiat 500. It's ah, doesn't sit right with me. It's definitely not part of a long term strategy. Maybe these the maybe Rabio is one of uh, one of many midfielders that we have lined up as potential De Jong alternatives. But Rabio is not a progressive ball carrier from deep, guys. He's not. Juventus fans are literally clapping the idea that, he, that, that he's going to be leaving. Clapping. They are ecstatic that he might be leaving a year earlier than they thought. He's on big wages too. Trust me. <sighs> Rabio, I can get, I can probably, uh, my, my mind can be persuaded. If Ten Hag thinks that he could coach him into being a better footballer and living up to that potential, then I would back him to do such a thing. Arn out of it, you won't. Uh, you, you just won't. And I hope full well that basically Bologna do us a favour and stay firm. Just hold on to him, man. Hold on to Arn out of it. Somebody else do United's job for them. Seriously. That's why I think so anyway. But yeah, Anthony, I genuinely think they are. Juve again, a cracking deal here. But is it? Cool. Yeah, so is Paul Pogba. And you know what? I've got goddamn border having that conversation. 
And I don't particularly want to commit any energy to having that same conversation again about a player who's cracking one week and disappears the next. And then his agent does something in the international transfer window. And then all of a sudden he's getting disciplined. But then he comes back and has two cracking games. And all of a sudden there's a bit of an issue around him again. And it's a constant side show and a circus for the manager. That's the sort of player I don't want Manchester United to be going after. But it seems like Manchester United are going after him. Adrian Rabio, where yesterday we heard reports that we'd agreed a £15 million fee. Uh, and then we're hearing talks now that the personal terms are being discussed. Let's find out, right? Rabio, as I say, is somebody I think could definitely work out. But it would have to work out. And you'd kind of have to swim upstream with him as well. Arnautovic, get in the bin. Just get in the bin. And Milinkovic Savic, well, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be nice. I like that. I think Milinkovic Savic would definitely be an upgrade. But still not in the exact position where we need strengthening. Let's go. I'm going to read a few of your comments out down here and see what you're saying. Uh, well, Rahman, that ship has firmly, firmly sailed. Um, did, 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 did. How are you eating? I think they will. I mean, they are. FIFA Pro is already looking into it, but nothing's being done at this particular moment in time, but they probably will. Uh, I have already mentioned Andrea Bellotti. Yeah, he must not have caught that one. Uh, da, 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 da. Gaziz, obviously, that's something that he would back himself to do. But I don't know what man Did he work under Laurent Blanc at, P at PSG? And did he have the Champs uh, and the Legri? And I don't know who else it was at before Legri. They've all struggled. They've all really, really struggled. Uh, has Ten Hag's obsession with De Jong brought the situation? You could try and argue that if you want, but I I stand by the fact that Eric Ten Hag would have had those assurances, man. And I, it's completely correct. We wouldn't be this far down the line if we didn't think that he would be happy to come to Manchester United. But for the life of us, no person in football could have predicted that Barcelona would stoop to the levels that they have stooped to. And the latest is that they are trying to say that De Jong's contract extension was actually criminal and that he's not owed any money and that maybe De Jong, Ter Stegen, PK and Longley might actually owe Barcelona money. You imagine the end of all of this when he was thought he was owed 17 million euros and they might now ask him for money. It's incredible. And they're getting, and they're being caught out at some dodgy accounting figures. They are the mob. They are the mob right now and we're involved with them. But look, I'm going to wrap this one up for today. I'm going to probably do a video this lunchtime on the Glazers strategy and updated video on it. I think it's important that I, I bring that out and I try and add some education's the wrong word. But it frustrates me so much seeing fans of other clubs and just people around the media just look at United spend over the last 10, 15 years and go, that's not the problem. The Glazers aren't the problem when they are fundamentally the heartbeat, the arms, the head, the le they are the problem. They are at the centre of all of it. And until they leave, the ambition of the club will always be drained away, down the waste. I'm going to do that video probably at lunchtime. Make sure you check it out. Thanks for joining in today. And as I said at the start of the video, if you haven't already listened to the podcast, let me quickly leave the link in the comments one more time here. Episode two is out today. Um, it was me, Alex, Matt and Bao. We speak about it all. Make sure you follow it there. But look, have a cracking day, everybody. Thank you all for joining in the comments, as you always do. United, eh? Never a dull moment. That's one way to describe it. Jeez.